Great. So Scott, one of the things that I know was talked about quite a bit at this conference you just came back from were some of the cases and the case law that's being established around Bitcoin. So um, we've been talking about them this afternoon. I thought maybe for the class, we just kind of go down some of the key um, cases that have taken place so far that have to do with Bitcoin and then talk a little bit about kind of the lessons learned from those cases. So why don't we start with the first one here. So SEC versus Shavers in 2013. Um, this uh, was really interesting because the uh, federal prosecutor uh, involved in that case was actually present at the conference. Um, and he was able to show how uh, without there needing to be any kinds of new laws about Bitcoin um, or a decision about whether Bitcoins were in fact securities um, that the Security Ex Exchange Committee would be in, in charge of regulating, um, they were nevertheless able to successfully prosecute um, this guy for uh, what was described as a good old-fashioned Ponzi scheme. Hmm. Um, and uh, it was the scheme itself um, that was being sold to people um, uh, with the advertising of a guaranteed 7% rate of return mm -hmm. each week. Uh, mm -hmm. That's uh, The scheme itself um, was the, the criminal instrument, huh. um, the fact that it had bitcoins underneath, um, they didn't need in order to yeah, the go Bitcoin forward with the prosecution. It was basically irrelevant. It was that he was doing a Ponzi scheme, right? right? And a Ponzi scheme is basically where you promise these great returns to people by making all kinds of investments or whatever, but really what's happening is you're getting more people to come into your system and bring more money into your scheme, which you use to pay out the new people. So really the lesson of um, SEC v. Shavers is don't do Ponzi schemes, right? And no new law or regulation or anything specifically about Bitcoin was required. What about this next one? Uh, this next one was a part of the fallout of Mt. Gox uh, imploding. Um, this is a class action lawsuit launched in Illinois, um, which uh, basically um, went after the head of Mt. Gox, the CEO, uh, as um, being corrupt as personally enriching himself um, with mm -hmm. the money that people were, were giving. So again, it was kind of an old fashioned case of corruption um, and taking people's uh, real money. Um, right. Uh, not the Bitcoin aspect of it was not sort of what was the, the, uh, yeah. that issue there. So again, it's like it's not like Bitcoin is a thing, but a basic kind of you know lesson learned is don't steal other people's stuff. <laughs> That's true. Don't steal stuff. What about this one? The Silk Road one? Ah, uh, yes. U.S. versus Albrecht, or um, as he is alleged to be the Dread Pirate Roberts, um, who is in, in charge of Silk Road. Um, this was uh, a criminal enterprise that was enabled through Bitcoin, um, but once again it was brought down through kind of Good old-fashioned police work and infiltration and yeah. um, and uh, tracing the money back to uh, right. back to El Elridge. So we could say here the lesson is, you know, don't engage in crime, <laughs> right? Or don't put so much trust into uh, into encryption and and uh, anonymous IDs that um, that you actually. Uh, actually believe it too much that it's going yeah. to keep you perpetually safe. Don't engage in crime and think you can get away with it. This next one, U.S. v. Faea et al., or the Shren case, tell us about that. Uh, well, this was a, a person running the um, in a Bitcoin exchange called BitInstance. Um, and uh, he was alleged not only to be doing this without complying with the uh, uh, Know Your Customer anti-money laundering mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, rules, um, but in fact to be engaged in exactly those kinds of uh, illegal activities. Um, so is, it, was it, um, is the lesson here, make sure you comply with AML, but also don't launder money? <laughs> so do your A M L. Don't don't launder money. Right, and in fact, at the conference, 
this was elaborated upon that your AML policies cannot simply be a document on your website saying that we comply with these policies. You actually need to do it and right, um, right, uh, and then look at the transaction flow through your system. Yeah. How about Liberty Reserve? Liberty Reserve did not involve uh, bitcoins. It, mm -hmm. it comes from a, a previous um, uh, round of kind of digital um, innovation on the web. Um, uh, it's an ongoing um, mm -hmm. uh, case, but uh, uh, again, it seemed um, that it was not just the case that they didn't have a money transmitter um, mm -hmm. license, but um, that in fact they were making their money um, by engaging with people um, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, that were doing criminal activity. Uh -huh. So here, it's both you know don't engage in criminal activity and think you can get away with it. But also, if you're doing something that looks like money transmission, you should get a money transmitter license. <laughs> yes. Get uh, money. And that can be a little tricky, because in the US, um, you have to go to 47 different states, as well as the District of Columbia, uh, to get, to get that license. license. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Finally, we've got a couple of, of things here. Satoshi Dyson feeds the birds. Why don't you tell us about those? Uh, yes, these were um, uh, uh, companies that were uh, selling these products online, and they tried to do an IPO. Mm -hmm. um, but they did not uh, uh, really go through the steps that's necessary to make sure that the investors attracted to an IPO um, are informed of, of the risks. And, um, so did they, benefits. so normally when there's an IPO, you have to register with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, what did they do? I believe they said, we are doing Bitcoin related activity and, and we don't need to, um, right. to, to, <laughs> to fall under, <laughs> under your purview, which attracted the attention of the Security and Exchange Commission. <laughs> so the lesson here is, if you're gonna do an IPO, even if it's a Bitcoin related IPO, Register with the SEC. And probably more generally, don't taunt government agencies um, that, that have significant uh, criminal enforcement arms. Yep. I guess, you know, one thing that's really interesting to me running down these cases is how in each of them, Bitcoin really isn't the issue, right? The issue is existing regulations, existing rules, law, and policy around everything having to do with fraudulent schemes to um, theft to you know uh, registering with the appropriate agencies if you want to have an IPO. Um, Bitcoin isn't the thing that's being kind of brought to trial, so to speak. It's all these other things that people happen to be doing kind of with or around Bitcoin-related businesses. Right, and so that certainly makes sense for this kind of first batch of, um, of cases. Of cases. Um, I think, uh, uh, what was interesting was what comes after this, and mm -hmm. uh, what kind of um, opportunities does blockchain technology, for example, present to regulators for kind of building regulations um, and monitoring um, and transparency uh, yeah. right into the technology itself. Right. Now, to me, that's always been the really interesting thing about Bitcoin. Not so much Bitcoin as money, but Bitcoin in terms of the blockchain, and what the blockchain as a kind of public record that doesn't require a trusted third party um, can do for other areas of regulation and commerce. Um, and we'll just have to see how that unfolds. Yep. Great, thanks a lot. Sure.